good morning. We're here with Ron Nearing, the former California director of the Republican Party and now uh, engaged in teaching people about leadership across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were on a discussion panel last night here in, uh, in Houston at the King Street Patriots about Marco Rubio's immigration bill. Mm -hmm. How's a guy from California end up here in a Houston discussion panel about a Florida senator's bill? Well, it's great being in, in Texas. You know, I felt my tax burden drop the moment we passed out of uh, New Mexico airspace on the way over. And actually, we have so many Californians who are coming to Texas now because Texas is doing it right when it comes to economic development, encouraging uh, uh, business development, keeping taxes down, making the state competitive as opposed to other states like New York and California, which have gone in the wrong direction. Uh, but uh, what brought me to Houston on this particular uh, trip uh, was I met our, our friend uh, Adriana from Vosas. Uh, uh, in uh, Cute in, uh, in London about three weeks ago, where I was a part of the faculty for the Leadership Institute. It's a conservative organization that is committed to training conservatives around the country and around the world to give them the skills that they need to succeed. And so I met Adriana, and we were talking a little bit about immigration on the, actually on the uh, part of that uh, part of that time there. And she asked me to come out here and be part of this King Street Patriots panel discussion yesterday on immigration. It started as a discussion on immigration when it was first planned, and then the, the Gang of Eight bill was introduced, and so we spent a little bit of time talking about that, but mainly the underlying issues around uh, immigration reform. And so uh, I'm just glad any time I have to come to Texas and visit with former Californians here is a, is a good thing. Yeah, it's interesting driving around the streets here and the highways here in Houston, you see a lot of California license plates. And, yep. uh, and Governor Perry's been very successful in, in bringing both residents from California and businesses from California because of our climate here. Um, this bill now that Senator Rubio and the Gang of Eight, I don't know why we call these people gangs all of a sudden, but the Gang of Eight has brought forward something that's a great starting point for a discussion, I think. It, it's not the end all of immigration reform bills, but what parts of the bill that you've looked at do you like? Well, I think that this is the starting point for a discussion. Uh, I think that the Gang of Eight Senators have said that we want to pass this bill as we've written it with no amendments and so on, but we know how the legislative process works. And we know that the House was, is a co-equal branch of, of government. They're going to want to have their say on things as well. But I think that any time we have Republicans talking about their positive, forward-looking solutions on immigration, it's a positive thing to have that discussion. Because one of the traps that Republicans have fallen into is only talking about immigration in the negative in terms of what we're against, instead of talking about what we're for. And there are lots of reforms of the immigration system that Republicans are for and can be for, which actually the unions and the Democrats have a problem with, but we don't call them out on it when we're only talking about our own ideas in the negative. So I think it's a step in the right direction. I think that there is a consensus on things such as border security, and having a guest worker program, and so on. I think there's a consensus within the country and uh, within the Republican Party on those issues. Where I think we don't have a consensus yet is how we deal exactly with those 11 million or so people who are in the country, uh, who overstayed their visas, or who entered the country illegally. And there's a real debate that has to take place there. Uh, and, uh, and it has to take place, I think, within the, within the Republican Party. What is the conservative approach uh, that is positive, forward-looking uh, on this particular issue that's also consistent with Republican values? And I think that's an important issue is that we do maintain our Republican core principles and core values and respect for the rule of law. Although it's an interesting thing about this rule of law thing. You know, there's, there are bad laws and there are good laws, and we certainly need to respect all laws, but we need to work hard to change laws that don't work. And our current immigration system has many flaws, many holes in it, and it doesn't really work well to serve our business community and to serve the nation's economic needs. Remember, our current immigration system uh, was formed, uh, the, the entire formula was changed in the 1960s when it was the Democrats who ran Congress and who ran the executive branch under President Kennedy and then President Johnson. And a lot of the problems that we have today are rooted in some of the changes which they made back then. But one of the things that happened is doing away with the Bracero program, which was a guest worker program for agricultural workers. I'm from California. This was a very important program in California. And if we take a look at that one issue, we see that that program was done away with. It was abolished. The unions didn't like it. Uh, the Democrats got rid of it. And uh, prior to that, you had Mexican farm workers who 
go back and forth between Mexico and California, uh, and Mexico and other parts of the country. That program ended, but the underlying economic needs did not. And so those people who were in California, stayed in California, uh, many of them did, or they entered California illegally and didn't go back to Mexico because there was that work there. Uh, they felt that eventually this problem would be solved. And, and so government has contributed to the problem by having e immigration policies that don't match economic realities. And so there is a need for reforms. We have to talk about those reforms that we are in favor of, and where there is a consensus, and not just talk about where for border security and so on. We are, of course, for, for border security. But we're not only for border security, we can, we can be for far-reaching reforms beyond that. Absolutely, and, and I think that was one of the most impactful things you said last night in the, in the hearing, or in the discussion panel, was talk about what we're in favor of, because that's how you win people over to your side, is, is talking about the things that you support and you believe in, and convincing them that those are the right things to believe in. Yeah, I've, I've taught uh, candidates and elected officials and communications around the world for 13 years. And one of the basic principles of political communication is that we are for things and our opponents are against things, meaning that we have to define ourselves by what we are for, and then we label the opponents as being the anti-team. And our, our opponents in the Democratic Party and the unions understand this very well, which is why they run around with these little post-it notes and say anti, uh, and attach them to every Republican they can find. We're anti-labor, anti-environment, anti-whatever. Uh, but on the issue of immigration, if you wake up any Republican elected officials in the middle of the night and ask them quick, what's the Republican position on immigration? What are they going to say? We're against illegal immigration. So the first rule of political communication gets violated right out of the chute. And that's a mistake. So there are many things that we can be for, and we are for, on the issues of immigration reform. A safe, secure, and modern border. A guest worker program for low-skilled workers, agriculture, construction, etc. We can be for uh, allowing more uh, high-tech workers into the country. And that's another thing uh, which uh, the unions don't like because a lot of those high-tech workers come here and they become Republicans if they can become uh, citizens. We can be for simplifying the immigration process. Right now it's too complicated. It looks like it was you know, run by a cross between the post office and the DMV. We can be for simplifying that process having it be principled, but simplified. So there's a lot of things that we can do for. We just haven't been talked about. I think, I think that's a very good thing. You talked about some mistakes, and um, I'm going to transition to a different discussion topic here. Mm -hmm. As the former chairman of the California Republican Party, California used to be one of the most Republican states out there. You could always count on it coming in on, as a red state on election night, mm -hmm. particularly in, in your area in San Diego and Orange County. Uh, a lot of Republicans down there. What happened to California, and how can Texas, as a Republican state, avoid some of the pitfalls in becoming a, a blue state? Yeah, we had a couple things that happened. One is when the Cold War ended, and you had this massive shrinkage of the defense sector. There was a lot of defense industry jobs uh, that went away. Those people went elsewhere, uh, and uh, and as a result, those people were Republicans. They left the state, and uh, and or they had a powerful incentive to support Republican elected officials who would recognize the Cold War that we were involved with uh, and, uh, and so on. So that was a big change that happened right there. Number two is that our state in 1980 was 19% Latino and it's 38% Latino today. So the Latino population doubled in 30 years. The Asian population almost tripled from 5% to 13.6% of the population. So that means that California now, if you add Latino and Asian voters alone, is 51% of the population. Well, Mitt Romney lost both of those groups by about three to one. About 75% of Latinos and Asians voted for Barack Obama over Mitt Romney. That's a pretty powerful number. That means a statewide Democrat in California is getting 38% of the vote right off the top without counting a single white voter and without spending a dollar. That's pretty powerful. It's not sustainable. We will not win, absent a scandal, we will not win another statewide election in California until we solve this problem. Meaning, Republican candidates have to perform dramatically better among Latinos than they have in California. One place where Republicans are doing better among Latinos is in Texas. Uh, and uh, Governor Perry has gotten about 37% of the Latino vote in Texas. That's about 10, 12 points higher than statewide Republicans running in California. So there are some lessons that California Republicans can learn from Texas Republicans running statewide here. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Second is, that it's very important that Republican elected officials uh, look for, and particularly executives, look for every opportunity to identify and promote qualified 
Latinos into positions of responsibility. They should be an integral part of any Republican administration, whether you're a governor or a mayor or some other, some other office. And also when there are voices on the right or the left of intolerance, clear intolerance. I'm not talking about political incorrectness, but clear intolerance. We have to call them out on that. We have to be very, very clear. Uh, and, uh, and otherwise we're seen as not being even-handed or that our, you know, uh, that we don't mean it when, uh, uh, when we talk about the quality of opportunity and, and, and so on. That accusation comes about if we're seen as overlooking it, it blatant intolerance on one side and only criticizing it on another. And I would say finally, Republicans have to communicate the benefits of their ideas. This is something which Governor Perry has been very, very effective on. When he comes to California and talks about how much more competitive Texas is, what he's really saying is, here are what the benefits are of the Republican ideas that are part of Texas public policy that are absent from California public policy. So often our candidates talk purely in terms of the features of their ideas instead of the benefits of their ideas. Some people might think that talking about the benefits is somehow cheating or something. No, you have to communicate to people why is it better to have lower taxes? Why is it better to have a good balance in terms of a you know, regulatory approach? What are the costs uh, in terms of jobs and lost income when government regulators are allowed to you know, just go off unchecked and, and become you know, radical ideologues who do not keep in mind the human impact of what, what it is that they're advocating? Those are a couple of the things I think that. Uh, that it's important for people in Texas and California to understand. That's an interesting concept. In sales, we have a, a phrase that says that features tell and, and uh, benefits sell. Mm -hmm. and, and when you can put the benefits of, of a policy in such a, a story that people understand and they can relate to it in their own lives, they can see how it does make a difference to yep. them. Now, you're involved in, in teaching Republican leaders around the country how to be more effective in communication. Where can people go to, to learn more about what you're doing and how to be, well, engage you to work with them? Yeah, about um, when I was in college, I, uh, I was a political science major. I joined the Republican Party uh, as soon as I became 18, which was um, in May of uh, 1988. And so when I got to college in September 88, I joined the College Republicans right away. I was so excited to have a place where I could uh, where I could uh, become active in the Republican Party for those ideals that I already had solid uh, you know, within me at age 18. And then I learned about a group called the Leadership Institute, which actually taught people like me, conservatives, how to be more effective in terms of organizing and communicating. And, uh, and to this day, the Leadership Institute has trained tens of thousands of, uh, of conservatives to be more effective. And as a matter of fact, I'm, I've been a member of the faculty now for the Leadership Institute for 13 years. And so if you go to leadershipinstitute.org, you can learn more about the Leadership Institute and where you can get the training necessary to be more effective in communicating in terms of raising money, shaping the message, digital campaigns, every aspect of, of, of what's necessary to put conservative ideas into action, winning elections, being more effective in lobbying and advocating for things that we conservatives believe in. The Leadership Institute offers it, and uh, there's a wealth of training that's done in Washington and around the country. So there's probably a training school coming to uh, close by to any one of your, your viewers and listeners, and, uh, and people should take advantage of that. Now, last night we talked about you actually becoming a blogger on Texas GOP Vote, and uh, I'd like to welcome you into doing that. Thanks. Thanks. And I look forward to it. We look forward to seeing seeing what you have to say on our side. One thing about Texas GOP Vote is it's not a monolithic organization. Mm -hmm. We take a lot of viewpoints from a lot of different angles that we put, put forward. The conservative, it's all conservative message based, but but it, it's certainly not a, a monolithic. Well, I, th I think one thing is clear here in, in Texas, and that is the grassroots is very important in the Republican Party. Uh, I believe firmly that when our party is the party of the grassroots up and not top down, that's when we're the strongest. We lose our way when we become the party of Washington or the party of the state capital, etc. We have to always be the party of the grassroots, and your website helps people to be engaged in the process, help let the politicians know where the grassroots is and have a lot of debate and discussion as well. So you're not monolithic, you're not enforcing a single particular point of view. But on issues like immigration, we have to have that discussion so that we can be stronger and more effective when we go up against you know, the communists and the vegetarians uh, on election day. <laughs> and, uh, and what powerful, they are masters of this communication process and we've got to get better at it. Um, this plan brought forth by Senator Rubio, I think is a great point, starting point of discussion. 
uh, I would like to encourage everyone to not dig their feet in and just say no to this, but to actually get involved and look at the plan. Find the points of it that you like and let them know, let your legislators know about that. And, and find the points that you disagree with it and get involved in making the changes that you want to see in that. Yeah, if, if you're concerned about immigration reform, if you're concerned about the economy, if you're concerned about this legislation in any form, um, my advice to anyone out there, regardless of what your point of view happens to be, is number one, don't dismiss it out of hand because you're not going to have any credibility if you say the entire thing is junk. Uh, you, you will not be persuasive in that regard. So number one, understand it, identify what are you for, and lead with that. Right? Say that this is a time where we should take advantage of the opportunity to reform. As conservatives, we should be the party of reform. The Democrats and the liberals are the party of the of big government status quo. We're the party of reform, so we have to embrace that. Number one, what are you for? Number two, in terms of things that you're not for, what are your solutions to those areas that are impacted by the sections of the bill that you that you uh, that you may not be for right now? And what are your positive, forward-looking solutions or alternatives that you have in those particular areas? That's how we win this fight, not by saying, nope, this is all junk. Because when you say it's all junk, what your, what your opponents are going to say is, well, then you're a defender of the status quo. And you can't defend the status quo because it doesn't work. You know that the border is not as secure as it needs to be. You know that our system of legal immigration is entirely screwed up by government. And that we, have to, we can do better. We can do better than the status quo. Absolutely. I look forward to carrying on this discussion with you further as we, we write our articles on, on Texas GOP vote and, and uh, see where this goes. I think it's going to be a long and very interesting path to finally getting something done. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ron. Okay.